Hey everyone, and welcome to the great debate, uh, building a webinar with ChatGBT. Today, we are all about demystifying the process of crafting a webinar from start to finish, right? But now we're throwing AI into the mix. It's kind of like the big thing right now, right? And it's got us all wondering, hey, how can this boost our processes? How can it make us quicker, sharper? But I think the real question is, how do we use it? How does it work, right? And these are the big questions that we're going to talk through today. And we call this webinar uh, The Great Debate, not only because the topic of AI in itself can be pretty controversial, but because we truly want this session today, this webinar to be a discussion, a friendly discussion and a debate with all of you guys. So please submit your questions on the right in the Q&A and participate in the chat. Uh, we are going to be answering and interacting with all of you and engaging in a good, healthy debate around some hot topics. So to introduce ourselves, I am Carissa. I'm a proud member of the industry marketing team here at CNET. Um, I thrive on creative brainstorming and collaboration. Anytime there's kind of a new opportunity to do that and AI being one, I'm always one of the first in line to try it out. My focus is figuring out a way to use that technology or solutions without losing our unique voice, right? Keeping it critical, that critical kind of like human touch that we need in our marketing. So I'm excited uh, to discuss the potential of AI with you guys today. Over to you, Brooke. Yes, I love doing webinars with Carissa. We love making these fun and doing these really out there topics um, that are super relevant right now. For everybody, my name is Brooke Gracie. I'm the director of marketing here at Cvent. You know, I've always been interested in emerging technologies, but I have been particularly geeking out on AI. And I really, truly cannot wait to talk to you guys all about this potential power. And today what we're actually going to do is walk you through the five key stages of building a webinar and discuss best practices to use AI to help not only ideate, but also build, promote, execute, and even use those insights post-event. So with each stage, we're going to encourage you, again, to help us debate the pros and cons of using AI technology. We learned so much last month um, when using AI to help us build and execute our webinar. So we're going to be sharing all those fun insights with you guys along the way. Get ready to engage. We want to hear from you. So please use the chat to share your thoughts, your experiences, any best practices you have. Reality is we are all learning as we go here. None of us are experts yet. Um, so we're hoping that each of you can walk away with some ways that you can use AI to help create efficiencies within your webinar program. All right. So let's start from the beginning, right? It all begins with the ideation phrase, phase. This is where um, all the brainstorming happens, where your ideas come from, where approvals are sought, right? Essentially, this is the birthplace of your webinar. So to kick this section off, I want to kind of toss out a thought-provoking question for us all to kind of like think about. Can AI truly comprehend and mirror human creativity or is it simple some is it like simply something that just kind of like regurgitates pre-existing ideas right so as we talk through this pro process right now keep that question in mind so first things first you want to do a webinar well what's it going to be on right so let's think about brainstorming and how that works as a game of darts you can never be sure about which idea is going to stick, right? Which one's going to hit that bullseye? But you do have to kind of just give it a shot. You've got to try. And you have to keep practicing, and you'll get better at brainstorming and being creative over time, right? So now imagine using AI in this process. So instead of kind of shooting blindfolded or without any practice, or maybe only with like those three darts to hit your target, right? It opens up opportunity for you. It, takes away those limitations and increases your chances of hitting your target, right? So if you are doing brainstorming alone or in a group, AI can be the tool to kind of like streamline these thoughts, right? And it's there to help you get to your target faster and generate a bunch of ideas, giving you the chance to kind of like iterate on those. So it gives you a little bit of inspiration um, faster. So let's say you're planning a webinar and you're looking for some like cool ground breaking ideas, right? You're thinking, hey, what if I did a webinar that uses only 80 sound, sound lyrics, right? Or what if I make it like a skit? 
Well, AI can help you visualize those kind of seemingly offbeat ideas. And the best part is that it gives you the chance to kind of think about all those crazy ideas, right? Because no idea is a bad idea. And you then have the power to kind of react on those suggestions instantly and quickly. So you can refine your ideas and know where to draw the line. So maybe I asked it to make me a journey um, 80s themed topic and abstract. But once I saw um, it got a little bit too cheesy and I um, didn't like all of these song references and I stopped believing in that idea, right? I was able to kind of pivot quickly and say, all right, that was too far out of the lines, right? Where can I go? So it's a great way to kind of push yourself out of your com comfort zone or maybe mix styles or dare to be different and see what does it look like if I take that route? So how do we actually use AI to brainstorm then? What, is, what does that process look like? So this is kind of how we came um, to the topic of innovative event technology at events, which is the webinar that Brooke and I did about a month ago using AI to build the whole thing, right? So your first step is to find the context, understand what you're brainstorming about. We weren't aiming for a session uh, with a topic that was relevant to event organizers and marketers who might be planning events over the next couple of months. And our objective was really to kind of be exciting and provide insights that are still like really timely and relevant for what might be on their mind right now. Second step is understand the limitations. Recognize what AI cannot do, right? AI has a little bit of a disadvantage because it can only process certain information, right? It's It stops at a certain date and it can't identify and understand the subtleties of human thought or emotion. So it's your job to guide that. So when you are getting responses and using it to brainstorm, know that it kind of lacks that empathy and that human touch and you've got to kind of play with that, okay? The next thing is iterate fast. So this is use AI to speed up the idea generation and testing, right? So thinking about, we wanted to talk about on-site engagement at events. We tasked AI with generating conventional, unconventional ways to kind of engage event goers. And then it just spits out a lot of ideas, right? Over and over and over. Not all of them are good, but maybe there's one that I really like and jump on that and keep going and run with it. That's where the most creative ideas come from, right? Number two, keep an open mind, just like I said. Be receptive to those new, potentially unconventional ideas, things that you might not have heard of, and then explore those. Dive deeper into the ideas with AI. What does that mean? Give me examples, right? And you can select and blend the things that they give you to polish the ideas until they kind of meet your vision, right? So AI isn't just a tool for brainstorming. It's kind of that game changer, adding that layer for like fun, speed, and innovation to the process. So now you've got your idea, right? And you're like, I've got this topic and I'm so excited. Now I need to get approval so I can get my webinar ready and up and running, right? So when it comes to getting stakeholder holder approval, let's say for maybe a wild webinar idea that includes um, an out of the box speaker, AI can be super handy. So how can you get that green light for your event? Can AI help me do that? Well, absolutely. They can help you. And it makes this process much less daunting and makes it much easier to get that yes, right? It can identify potential stakeholder concerns and help prepare you for that conversation, for that pitch. Maybe you worry your VP of marketing might have some concerns about the strategy or your content director could be on the fence about it. AI can predict those things that, you know, hey, here are the people I'm talking to. Here's one of the things that are on their mind. Help me create points and things to kind of help support their concerns. And it can help craft that pitch. Another aspect where AI really shines is organizing the why. Getting all of your thoughts and goals down in a cohesive way can be kind of tricky, right? And that's where AI comes in. I tend to have all of these things and all these ideas in my head. And the hardest part is kind of getting them out, right? Getting them on paper, making sure that you have your kind of outline ready. So sometimes you can unload all of this, all of your vision into AI and help you help it ask you to kind of shape this message, right? Edit my thoughts, pinpoint my key arguments. What am I trying to say? Help cut some of the redundancies. And this is going to really help craft that pitch, right? So then knowing your stakeholders, personalizing that pitch is crucial. 
So what do they what do they care about? What are they focused on? Maybe your exec team right now is really focused on lead generation. So with AI, you can take that core reasoning and layer in then the stakeholder concerns. So you're not just building a case for your idea or your webinar, right? You're providing the solutions, making it easier to get that yes. So now that we've looked at that, I'm going to open it up to a debate with Brooke. So Brooke, what do you think? Is AI an asset or liability in event planning and ideation? Kind of this. I, don't, I think I'm going to take a firm stance here that AI is definitely an asset. Um, the efficiencies that it can give us is, is just amazing. And it's using those data-driven insights so I really do think that using this kind of technology when we're event planning or ideating can be hugely valuable. What do you think? All right. So you're going with yes. I feel like then just to just to kind of shake things up, uh, maybe I'll go with no, because I just talked about the yes. So I'm going to say no. Like, look, sometimes it gives me pages upon pages of all these ideas that are not great, right? And then I spend my time thinking about, well, should I use these ideas? Why didn't I think of them? Are they good? I don't feel like they're good, but maybe they are. And then I have to ingest and, and, and kind of visualize all the different ways these ideas might come to fruition. So is it kind of adding an additional hurdle instead of just like internalizing and trying to get those on paper myself? Yeah, I can see your point. I will say, though, that the ability that AI has to personalize with all the algorithms and the tailored content and things like that could save us a lot of time. I don't think it does. I do love it for, <laughs> for this day, especially because it, al it allows me. I tend to like like to kind of go off the wall sometimes. So like it allows me to like go there and then rein myself back in because I'm like, right. ooh, that did get really kind of funky. And I'm like, all right. It like gives me the inspiration. It gets the ball rolling. But we definitely, I think we talked about this in the last webinar, the the tech and the human, like we have to kind of marry those together. I don't think we can fully lean in and rely on AI solely. So maybe we found a good middle ground on that debate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and for our webinar last month, you know, Chris and I spent a lot of time in chat GPT. It helped us to write the outlines for the webinar. It helped us to write the talk tracks. It identified case studies that we could use. But as I was interacting with ChatGPT, you know, the question just kept coming to my mind that is this really the best and most ethical way to produce content? I mean, because candidly, it felt like magic. I would ask ChatGPT to write a talk track about using holograms at events. And then only seconds later, like, boom, I had the whole talk track written. But could I really jump on a webinar and read that word for word? Was it truly my intellectual property? This is a big debate out there. I'm very curious to hear what you guys are thinking. Um, uh, Chris and I have our eye on the chat here. So we would really love it if you guys go in there and chat us your thoughts about what you think about AI generating content and who truly owns that intellectual property. Is it machine or is it man? And while we watch that chat light up, I wanted to show you guys just a few ways that we used AI to build our content for our webinar. And the first thing we did is we determined the topics of the webinar. Before we even started writing chat GPT prompts, we needed to have a really clear idea of what is it that we want to talk about? What is the goal of this webinar? And that really helped us focus our prompts to create an outline that was relevant to the topic. And after we sort of had that general idea, it will it helped us um, to identify the main themes and some of those subtopics. So you can use ChatGPT for this as well. Our webinar was about innovative event tech. So we asked ChatGPT, what are some new technologies that are being used at events? And so it kind of gave us a list. And then we can start to drill in and say, you know, describe how are holograms being used at events? What are some do's and don'ts when using holograms at events? And you can see that the prompts we're using are very open-ended questions because this encourages that chat GPT model to generate responses that are related to that theme or topic, but gives it some leeway to give us all the information it can. 
Um, and after you've written the prompts and you've interacted with ChatGPT, you really do need to make sure that you're reviewing and refining them to make sure that they're relevant, that they're specific, that they're also open-ended. Um, it's all about that refining. I was actually having a conversation with one of my colleagues today. They were saying the same thing. It's, it's sometimes a little disheartening if you jump into something like ChatGPT as an AI tool and you write a prompt and you don't get back exactly what you want. That is to be expected. It's the refining. It's the keep asking it questions and you will get out of the tool what you want. So you ask it these questions, you start building an outline for a webinar. And again, you need to review and edit the outline. You need to make sure it's clear and concise and it's well organized. You need to add that kind of human touch um, and give it that sanity check. And then just continue building on the, the content because after we had a really sol solid outline, we then went back to ChatGPT to fill in our talk tracks, like write a 30 second talk track about the do's and the don'ts of using holograms at events, or even asking it, identify a case study where holograms were used at an event. Now it sounds like magic, right? So how is AI creating all of this content super quickly? And frankly, what's the catch? AI algorithms, they are creating mathematical models. It mimics human intelligence because it's processing all this data super, super fast and it's recognizing patterns and it's making decisions. Using a natural language processing, you know, AI analyzes text and it identifies again the key themes and the key ideas and that's how it's creating this outline in seconds. And AI generated outlines can be more accurate. It could be way more efficient than human generated ones, but it's gonna miss those subtle nuances and it may lack that creativity. So while you know AI can supplement human creativity, we have to be kind of realistic and understand that it can't replace it entirely. Now, when we think about the ethics surrounding AI content creation and ownership, it's very complex, it's multifaceted. Because that AI generated content has ra raised concerns about the impact on traditional content creation industries. You have your journalists, you have your creative writers, and is there a potential loss of jobs that we're talking about here? There's also, you know, a lot of concerns around the authorship, the attribution, you know, because when you start to use AI generated or ChatGPT content, it blurs those lines between human and machine authorship. And it makes it really difficult to determine who should be credited as the author of a particular work. I was actually on a webinar yesterday talking about a similar topic. And the webinar producers and I were talking about how there was a celebrity that wrote a book. Then somebody used ChatGPT to write a summary of that book. And the celebrity truly felt like they were being plagiarized. And these are the conversations we're having especially when you're looking at AI generated content that is sold or distributed for profit, you know, that can continue to blur those lines even more. So if we go to our next debate, Carissa, what do you think about the convenience, of course, of using AI generated content overriding those potential ethical concerns? I know. It's a I mean, <laughs> what do I think? I, I mean, I do think the convenience, of getting started is worth it, right? And then we've got a lot of people in the chat talking about, you got to change it, you got to tweak it. I rewrite it, I use it as that starting point. And sometimes I think the hardest part of any project or any concept is, is getting started, right? Is getting your ideas down. And I think it helps then kind of boost that 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 work, right? That, that stuff. And then you can really work on making it your own. Um, as opposed to just kind of like taking it completely. So I think it's, the question is tough because it's, it depends on what you do with the content that you get back. Totally. I and I think one of the other ethical concerns that maybe we don't talk about a lot is potential bias as well when you're using an AI model, because the training data could be biased and that means it's generating content that could perpetuate these biases or leading to skewed or unfair representation. So I think it's important for us to kind of talk about that as well. Yeah, I like that. I think someone mentions that in the chat. And then um, 
a few other things um, that have come up um, is Jocelyn says, hey, there's every time I use AI to write word, to write content, right? They always use the word unlocking over and over again, unlocking, unlocking. So are there any patterns that you're even seeing in AI that can help you catch this and say, all right, I can tell. I think there are tools out there now that help kind of identify. You can put content in there and it can say like, yes, this is definitely written by a human or like, it sounds like it was written yeah. by a robot, um, which is kind of which is kind of interesting. So I'm a mix so, on this debate, right? I think it's it's convenient. Be ethical about it. Definitely. I have to call out um, Andrea, though. Who I love this comment that she made in the chat about having a conversation with your AI, giving them a name, kind of like humanizing it. I know we've talked about that in the past, too. We call our chat bot chatty. Um, but I love that. So please keep the really amazing conversation going in the chat. Um, if you guys are sharing some really, really good um, insights. And you know, there are valid arguments, right, for both uh, for and against the idea that AI is even sophisticated enough to target and engage diverse audiences. Because on the one hand, you know, AI algorithms, they and again, they're processing huge amounts of data very quickly and accurately. And so it allows them to create these personalized um, and culturally sensitive content that could resonate with diverse audiences. But additionally, you know, AI could also be used to translate content into multiple languages, which could then increase accessibility and inclusive, inclusivity. So there's kind of two parts to this argument as well, right? Because that AI generated content could also lack creativity. It could be inauthentic. It's gonna lack that emotional connection, which could potentially alienate diverse audiences. Um, they're using or relying on have very heavily into user data. So it could lead to narrowing down and stereotypical assumptions about audience behavior. So it's a really interesting topic. Please, we want to know what you guys think in the chat. Send us your thoughts about this um, debate around AI. And, you know, this topic is so important, especially when we're discussing the promotion of an event of a webinar, you know, like we did last month, because we used AI to help us build these promotional assets. We learned a ton of valuable lessons along the way. But first and foremost, probably the greatest thing we're seeing is that many tools have AI built right in. You know, these are going to help you to save time and create efficiencies with content. So like in Cvent, for example, we have a writing assistant built directly into our product. It's going to help with everything from creating event emails to enhancing event descriptions to writing speaker bios. And that is exactly what we used it for. You can just take a look here about how the AI writing assistant can actually help you level up your event descriptions and it can make it the most enticing for your customer. I love you see how right now it's letting you choose the tone. It's letting you choose the length. It's giving you a lot of options to get out of it exactly what you need. So what we did is we gave AI um, writing assistance a little bit of context about our uh, webinar topic. We changed the tone. We wanted it to be a little bit more enthusiastic. And then we let it work its magic. And once we felt it was perfect for us, we just inserted it right into the site designer. And when we're writing the webinar title, the abstract, or really even a script for um, a teaser video, we did that using AI as well. And it really came all down to the prompts. You have to use those open-ended questions. And I know I'm harping on this, but you have to continue to refine your prompts until you look what you're looking or until you get what you're looking for. Um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if somebody asked me to sit down and write five webinar titles just from scratch, just use your creative brain, Brooke, my entire brain falls out of my head. I have no idea, all my creative energy is gone. But if somebody hands me a list of, here's a, you know four or five webinar titles I think might work, I'm all about it. I can go in and I can edit it, I can massage that a little bit and come out with an amazing title um, for a webinar. And so that's kind of how I think about it. Like that is what ChatGPT Chat did for me. And the other you know, crucial part of promotion, and I'm sure we have a lot of marketers in the audience right now, but when we talk about promotion, we are hand in hand talking about personalization. 
we know that our audiences require that personalization, especially in this day and age. Um, so you can help AI to actually understand your personas. So then it can help you write persona specific promotional content. It's kind of what Andrea was saying in the chat, right? Teach it. Teach it to be the writer that you need it to be to understand your personas. Um, and you can do this by, first, you need to define your marketing personas. You need to know who is this target audience, what are their demographics, what are their interests, their pain points, what are their behavior patterns. And you need to understand that before you then go to chat GPT and train it. And uh, you can do this by actually feeding the model with text that is representative of your target audience's language, of their tone, of their interests. You can provide the model with prompts related to your marketing personas and then use those responses to, again, refine and improve the model's understanding of your particular audience. Now, once you've done that, the work isn't over, though, right? We have to test. You can test its understanding of your marketing personas by even just providing it some sample text written in the tone and language that you're looking for and then continue to refine and improve. Your target audiences may evolve and change as well. So you can continue to update ChatGPT model to make sure that it remains relevant and it's super accurate. And this could involve, you know, updating that training data, updating the prompts or the algorithms to then reflect the changes in your audience's behavior. Pretty cool, huh? I thought so. Um, so let's get to our next debate. And this is about um, AI being... Um, an evolution, like is marketing actually an evolution in precision or a regression in the personalization? I'm going to let you choose a side first, Krista. Mm, I'm going to say, ooh, I get to go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to say it's a regression in personalization. Okay. Okay. Because I'm, I'm feeling like being controversial. Um, I think that there is such thing as too much personalization where then it starts to feel disingenuous. And I think about, um, you know, when we all first started writing emails a lot and we used all the tags, hello, Brooke, how are you? I hear an insert place of living is really great this time of year. Like, and it became almost to force. Like, you're like, I know you didn't personalize that to me because I can tell that it's just automated to make it feel personal. And when you do that, I think the question is, is it truly personal? And it took us a while to catch on to that, right? The first couple emails we got with those data tags, you know, back in the day, we were like, oh my gosh, they're speaking directly to me. This is so amazing, right? So I think that to your point, I think it's going to catch on. This technology is going to have to continue to improve for us to be able to use it because, I mean, it's already happening, right? Can you just write a blog post with chat GPT and post it as is? Like, it, the the world out there will rec start to recognize it, but also already, you know, the, these tools, the search engines, they recognize that and it may not show up. Um, so yeah. it can become an SEO concern as well. Um, that being said, I definitely feel like there's opportunity here, even when it comes to the automation. Like, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, as a director of marketing here at Cvent. I still find that it's hard to get time to make those strategic decisions, you know, and really live in the strategy and not in the weeds of things. And so if we can teach AI to like do those sort of tasks, those more repetitive tasks for us, then we'll have a lot more time to do the, str the strategery, you know, the like strategery. I like that. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I do, I do think there it, if it used the correct way, it is it is an evolution. I'm laughing because Sally says, you know, like I would definitely not want a love letter written to me using <laughs> by ChatGPT, and it, it right. exactly like that is something in, um, emotional, right? That needs to come there. But like maybe I'm not an, a poet, maybe I'm not an author, and it's a good place mm -hmm. to use to start, right? Um, yeah. And then you can tweak it to your personal style and your audience. So I think that that's key. Yeah. I also love Audra's comment in here about remembering that um, the data that 
really is part of chat GPT is pre 2022. Carissa, you and I were talking about this earlier. We were like, was it really the smartest idea to build a webinar on innovative event tech with a tool that's pre 2022? Like probably maybe not. Right. So I think that there's like, there's a lot of things to consider when we're talking about using this technology and we know it's going to improve, but I just love having these kinds of conversations. I do too. Um, all right. So lots of good conversation too in the chat. So thank you guys. I love kind of reading through all of your insights and sharing. So let's delve into the heart of, okay, we've got the idea for the webinar. We've promoted the webinar, right? It is built and now we're ready to go live. So our question here kind of in this execution phase of our webinar is, does AI's impersonation of human interaction detract from the authenticity of the event or the content. Um, so what do you guys think? So for some background here, just in case um, you weren't with us last time, one of the unique things about the webinar that we hosted um, last month is not only did we test and build the whole thing with AI as a support, but we also decided that we were gonna have um, ChatGBT AI, our little um, robot friend as a speaker, right? So what did that look like? There were some key logistical questions that we had to answer, right? And think about how are we going to execute this webinar with AI as a speaker? How raw should we let those responses be? Because we've all talked about brought up, hey, we need to teach and prompt AI. So what we did um, was we worked kind of ahead of time and prepared those res um, responses. And then we played them during the webinar. So we could try to strike that balance between authenticity and coherence, right? Because it was cru that's crucial. So you might think that, hey, having an AI speaker is a piece of cake, right? They're ready to go 24 seven. They have no scheduling conflicts. They need no rehearsal, but here's the deal. It's, it's not that simple. Um, we took our original inspiration from a live show that had an actual robot on stage. Um, here's a shot that one of our colleagues took at a fintech conference on the future of tech B2B marketing. So look at it. Isn't it cute? Um, and now for this in-person session, you have to think, how did that robot get up there? Who takes it off? Does it need to charge? Like, wh where do you even get the robot? So these considerations add a whole new layer in planning. But our challenge was unique, right? Because we were working online and not in person. An AI can't just join or log in from a computer like a human would. So that is where we really had to work closely um, with our webinar producer, Greg. Hi, Greg. He's here. Um, and we had to figure out how to give our AI speaker, who we call Chatty, um, not only like a, a, a presence, right, but how do we actually do that? How do we execute it? So we went ahead and had to create kind of a dummy persona or an account for Chatty, which then meant somebody had to submit those responses live during the webinar. So it was actually adding another team member into the mix to support kind of AI as a role. Then came kind of the visual rep representation. What is Chatty going to look like? Um, Brooke and I, in particular, were rooting for this kind of lively animated creature. And on the other hand, um, our producer Greg had a more kind of realistic humanoid um, robot in mind, right? And isn't it interesting that we all kind of see and imagine AI differently? Um, so ultimately, we chose the animated version because we wanted Chatty to be kind of approachable and playful and embody the spirit of kind of creativity and fun that we wanted to have in our session. So we felt that this humanoid robot, right, was a little bit too like I robot intimidating to fit our vibe, right? We wanted it to match the energy of our human speakers. And I don't know about you, but I think um, Brooke and I are way more like that happy wavy fella than the I robot looking guy. So the biggest puzzle of all, and I think somebody has already mentioned it in the chat was, how do you lend a voice to something that is inherently voiceless? So this was kind of, I would say, our biggest bump um, in the webinar that we did. Um, 
as with any new technology, right, you are trying new things and experimenting and sometimes it doesn't always stick. So here's a little spark where we kind of fell on our face, right? And it was the robot voice. Oh, the, the robot voice. We just, we decided we were like, okay, well, people aren't going to want to read the whole transcript. How can we do it? Maybe we can make him talk, right? So we came up with this idea of this robotic robot voice, and it turned out to be way less appealing than we had thought. Um, it didn't add that futuristic edge, right? It didn't become engaging. It kind of became a turnoff. So let's just say, I think everybody made their folk, their um, opinions very clear on the AI voice. So in retrospect, that was a miss. Hey, but it's all about experimenting, right? And if you don't try new things, it's not always going to work. And despite the hiccup, I like to think that we put on a pretty memorable session, right? It might have been a little bit like having kind of that weird, unusual, annoying friend join chat GBT, but at least it made for kind of a unique experience. So what do you guys think? To what extent should we try to bring some sort of human touch to robots, basically? I mean, I'm glad that we can laugh at ourselves, right, Krista? Because the <laughs> robot voice did not <laughs> did not land. But I think we're all kind of, I mean, it goes back to all the conversations we're having here where it's like, do we need to give credit where credit is due, possibly? And I think that's where we were approaching this is, we want AI, we want Chatty to be a character in our webinar because we leaned on it so much to build the content. And we really felt like Chatty needed some credit. Um, but yeah, it, it is tough to think about starting to humanize it. And I don't know, I think I'll always think of, of Chatty as a little animated character. He's kind of like friendly. <laughs> He's so friendly and approachable, right? And I right. love it, but... I it, guess it is tough. Too, you want him to be approachable. It would be different if I had like some like AI scientist, like uh, then maybe I would want him to be a little yeah. bit less bubbly looking. Right. Right. And then of course it's the ethical concerns too, right? Like the more human, like we start to make, you know, AI or any technology, really the more ethical concerns that start to arise, like, right. We don't want love notes written by chatty. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, we, we see it happening. It is moving towards that more human element. You have a, a robot on stage at a, you know, at a presentation. Um, the ethical concerns are going to continue to come up. I think, yeah. And, and I think it's, there's, there's the ethical concerns and then there's like a little bit of a creep factor, right? Um, yeah. I, one of the really interesting things that has nothing to do with events, but when you think about um, animation, they've been kind of struggling with this over the course of like CGI over the last couple of years, right? Animation cartoons, like they got almost too realistic where then you're like, Ooh, that is kind of creepy. And now you look and you watch like some of the new animated movies, right? And you look at things like the water and the landscape and you're like, well, that looks real. Like that is, that could be a photograph. Right. But then you look at the people and they still have these kind of like odd size proportions to their mm -hmm. face. And it's because the animators had to make like a conscious decision to say, if we make it too accurate to what humans look like, it's starting to get a little creepy. Yeah. So what is that balance, right? And how do you do it in a way that you're like excited about and makes you feel comfortable without kind of being like, ooh. Yeah, like creep factor. I don't know if you guys have seen, well, f there's two things. First, there's this amazing video. It was, it's a new commercial. I think I sent it to you, Krista, where it's Jennifer Lopez. And it's kind of making fun mm -hmm. of the fact that they're using her image, you know, but the, it's not her th thought process, right? Like somebody else is feeding it to her. Super hilarious. Please, you guys track it down. But the conversation that came up always after watching that video is the Black Mirror episode. I don't know how many of you guys have watched the newest season, I think it's like everybody hates Joan or something like that, but it's sort of that concept, right? Where it's like using somebody and their image without their permission. And so it starts to become a really gray area. Went on a little bit of a tangent there, but I mean, who doesn't like Black Mirror, right? That's what debates are for. Yeah. All right. And so the debate over, of course, um, whether AI's analytical precision outweighs its inability to understand nuanced human response in a post-event analysis 
also has valid arguments on both sides. So we know, again, I feel like I've said it a hundred times, AI can process a large amount of data very quickly, very accurate, accurately. So this is going to lead to data-driven insights that we can get. However, AI may oversimplify and inaccurately analyze human responses. It could result in recommendations that maybe don't fully align with human needs. Um, and so it should be used, again, with human expertise to make sure we're getting a more holistic understanding of data. But I want to hear what you guys think. Share your thoughts in the chat. How are you using AI to analyze data and get those insights that you need? When it comes to data analytics, there's several ways that you can use um, AI to help provide insights into events, such as a webinar. First, the AI algorithms can analyze chat logs. It can analyze Q&A sessions. It could be doing this in real time. I was actually talking to um, a colleague earlier today, and we were talking about how you know some of the, the meeting platforms, you know, it's it plugged right in. You can turn on a setting and it will basically integrate that AI technology and give you notes after a meeting you just had and tell you what the key takeaways were. It's really cool stuff. And it allows us to get a more comprehensive and a detailed understanding of what's the audience's feedback, what kind of engagement we were getting. Secondly, you can start to analyze the audio, um, the video content of a webinar, and it could start to identify uh, patterns and trends even in the speaker's tone, in the pace, in the delivery style, and it will start to identify areas where the speaker was particularly engaging or where maybe the audience lost a little bit of interest. And I can think of, gosh, so many ways we could use that data, even from speaker training um, to you know, help people improve on their engagement level as a speaker to, again, possibly making real-time adjustments to make sure your content is as engaging as it can possibly be. And then thirdly, um, analyzing the demographics and the behavior of the audience. It could look at location, age, interests. All these kinds of things can help identify patterns and trends in the audience's behavior and their preferences which is so great for us as marketers, right? To understand what people like so we can do more of that in future marketing and content strategies, which leads us to our last hot topic. Is AI capable of providing genuine human understanding? Uh, I'm going to say no. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm all about AI. I like, let's do the thing. Chatty, love you. But I don't really know if Chatty understands me as a human. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think too, anytime you look at data, right, you can pull patterns and trends out, but like, it, why? Why did that trend happen? What impacted that pattern? Like those questions you're never not going to ask those questions about data. So even if it comes out and it says, okay, here's here are your meeting notes, right? Here are the stats. Here's all the things you need to know. It's like, great, I know those things, but what do I do with them? How do I activate on those? And I think that's where the, the human understanding part comes in. Yeah. Martin agrees with me, just so you know, in the chat. He says, Martin. Hey, I, there's no chance. Yes. I got you, Martin. <laughs> um, I do like to think though, Andrea, um, cracks me up. She talks about it as her alter ego, right? Like it uses, she uses it to compliment herself. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is exactly how it is intended to be used, right? That is, yeah. that's, that's that balance. You have to bring the human side to, to AI or technology, right? Um, yeah. And it can help make the most impact of the human side. You can be like your best uh, understanding and best insights as an individual, but it can't give that to you. So you need to kind of work as like a little like Batman Robin team. Yeah, definitely. The chat, the chat also is there's a, a conversation going in here about um, just sharing information into the tool itself. And if there are there privacy security concerns, I think Somebody um, said something about, oh, it's Judy, about sharing organizational information, right? Is that eventually going to become all available for anyone? I know another, a little bit of a tangent here, but I just, these comments are just giving me life. I love this. Such a good conversation. I know. You guys are killing it. I think, so this, this is kind of what, where we're at now. So 
we're having a great conversation. We've talked about, okay, we want to do a webinar. What does it look like to think about doing that webinar? What does it look like to start promoting that webinar? What does it look like to build a webinar? What does it look like to execute the webinar? What happens after? So now we're at the stage of our conversation where what is the future of technology? What does that look like? Are we all going to be replaced by machines at some point? And I think it's so great to read everybody's examples in the chat of how they have used AI or how they are doing these things. And I think I'm going to say it like this kind of like my meta wrap up, right? I think the future of technology technology is human. We need to be there with it. We need to guide it. We need to teach it. So there's this fear all the time that technology is going to replace us and technology is going to do these things. But I think we got to be along for the ride, right? And that's that's what it's going to look like. That's what our future is going to be. And the sooner that we are able to test it out and try it and learn as ourselves, right? Yes, it's not always going to work. Sometimes you're going to use bad robot voices in webinars that people really don't like, but sometimes you're going to really create amazing things. So it's just like learning to ride a bike. You just got to kind of try. So I think the future of technology is us. Um, and now we are going to switch to some Q&A and do some questions. So submit your questions via the Q&A over there on the right. Um, you can continue to talk during the chat. Um, we are going to stick around and answer some questions for you. It's my favorite part. There's so many good questions too. Okay. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? I saw somebody ask about, um, oh, here we go. Well, this is exactly the question. I saw. <laughs> Great job, Brittany. She's behind the scenes of leading our questions into us. Um, will you be showing, uh, showcasing any AI at CVent Connect? And Brittany is also going to be very excited to hear us tell you that we are going to be talking about AI. We're specifically going to be talking about the AI um, capabilities that are built within Cvent products, which is is very cool. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, but Chris, I bet you have more information about it. Yeah, if you're coming to Cvent Connect, if you're going to be live with us in Vegas, first of all, like I hope to see you guys there. Um, second of all, there is a really cool AI dedicated section in the Innovation Pavilion this year. Um, and I don't want to spoil too much about what's going to go on there, but we're going to have some meetups and some cool activities for you guys and things for you to learn about. So yes, we will be showcasing AI. I hope we're going to be there, Kate. Great. Right? Kate. Bring all your friends. <laughs> all right. How can you make sure that elements such as your title have not been plagiarized from someone else? Well, I think this is a this is a great question, right? Um, and just like back in the day when we were all writing history papers or college thesis papers, right? There are tools that can help check for plagiarism. There are some really great ones out there um, for AI now. To I think I mentioned it earlier. Like, yes, this is entirely generated by a machine, or yes, this feels like a human wrote it or you can bounce plagiarism off there too. Those are new still because AI is so new. So there are a ton of options out there. Some work better than others, um, but use the tools to kind of do that check, I would say. Okay, do the prompts connect with each other as you ask them or are they just kind of like a standalone um, answer and then you as the user need to jill in and refine. Um, the, the answer is yes. I mean, actually, well, it's kind of a two-part question. So <laughs> let me, <laughs> um, so ChatGPT does learn. It's, it's learning from you essentially, but maybe not in the exact way. It um, it is using contextual memory to remember and reference some previous inputs. Um, ensuring that you're getting like the most consistent responses. I think we're seeing that in the chat here from some other people, right? They are, they're teaching this tool about who they are. And it's kind of, kind of the way you described it, sort of connecting those prompts together and learning as you go. Yeah. Like when I'm asking it to write me stuff or like helping, sometimes it'll come back with something and I'll be like, Ooh, like less stiff 
like bring a little bit more fun yeah. into it or else I can have way too much fun or tweak it a little bit for this audience. So you can do like running prompts and it will keep reacting to you, um, which I think is key. Um, so yes, that kind of works down as like the drill down refinement to see kind of what you can get. Well, the AI program used the, that data I put in there as a reference for other people. You know what, Chris, I don't know if you definitely know the answer to this, but I, I think I might, but I'm curious if you, if you have a little bit more detail. I believe so. Um, not word for word, but like when you log into certain AI tools, cause there's a whole bunch out there and we've got like an internal tool. And then we've got the chat GBT, like public facing tool. And it always gives you this disclaimer on like, we are using responses to like practice and generate better, more interesting content. So I think anytime you put information into AI, it's a, it's a risk that you take. So don't put any like private information in there or sensitive information. Yeah. One of the questions that's been on my mind, and maybe we can all learn together, maybe somebody in the chat knows the answer to this, but a use case I've been thinking about is back to the marketing personas, right? Is there a way that we could kind of train the chat GPT or the AI tool that we use within Cvent about our marketing personas and then share that with the rest of the marketing team, right? Like almost sort of like this is our kind of marketing AI tool that we use. Um, so that question's really been on the top of my mind lately, and I, I'm hoping to dig in a little bit more. Um, of course, we'll share whatever information I come up with, but um, it's a really interesting conversation right there. It, it could be really great thing, and it could be not a great thing if you don't want people understanding your organizational structure, for example. Oh my gosh, Victor in the chat is hilarious. He says, can chat GPT plus Alexa replace my wife? <laughs> You're in so much trouble, Victor. <laughs> um, how would you begin to use AI to summarize the takeaways from the event? I, I think that's a great, great question. We've done it before where um, we'll take survey feedback information and put it in there and ask them, hey, what, what are the common themes that we're seeing here in some of our feedback? What are the common comments that we're seeing? What does it mean? How can we iterate on those better, right? So that that is one way we can do it. Um, I know when I look at like mass programming, it's like, all right, here are the sessions. Here's what all of the attendants look like. Which ones were trending? Which topics do you see or what patterns do you see in session registration that will really stand out? And what can I do to activate on those? Like, what else can I do? Like, how can I capitalize on that? Like, give me some more ideas in that same vein or same attitude of topics and stuff. Um, so that's one way I have used it so far. Brooke, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking when I originally read this, I was like, well, if the, the event is one session. So like if the event is a webinar, it's much easier, right? You could plug in AI, like, for example, we use zoom for meetings at, at c event right we can we have a tool that we can use that will automatically every time we start up a zoom meeting it will look at that will it'll listen it will look at the chats it will do everything and then it will summarize the transcript and it will give us key takeaways it'll do all of that for us but when you're thinking about an event that's a hundred sessions or something like that it could probably get a little more complicated right but you could pick key sessions and have it analyze that and then take those analyze results and say, now find commonalities here, you know, because again, the tool itself is designed to go through data super, super fast. So, and all the tech you're using at your events is collecting said data, right? So it's all about just kind of putting it into the tool and letting it go through and, and find the, find the key, key takeaways. I love that. Um, and just a reminder, everybody, go ahead. And if you have any questions, I know we're getting to kind of the end of our session. Chuck them in the chat. We're going to try to do our best to answer them or stick around. Um, but I do love Judy's comment of feeding it a transcript as of a meeting um, and asking it to spit out key points. And honestly, I find whenever I use ChatGBT, putting transcripts in there, whether it's of a meeting or um, even just like I turn 
I open a Word doc on my computer and I just dictate a whole bunch of thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams in there. And then I put it in ChatGBT to kind of help craft whatever the heck I was trying to do. That is where I've come up with the best content because it is still me or still the, the kind of humans and the individuals generating that content. Um, and ChatGPT is just helping us clean up and refine. So I, I'm a big transcript person in chat in AI. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the next question, um, evidently we all need a little more training, <laughs> right? Um, is there a webinar or, or training on how to begin using the setup chat GBT? And there isn't right now, but luckily you're talking to two of the people who love to submit webinar ideas. So we're going to take that back to our team. Um, you know, just anecdotally, like here at Cvent, and I'm sure a lot of the organizations you guys are working at, it's becoming increasingly more part of the conversation about AI. And there's a barrier, right? There's the, we can kind of talk about how you can use ChatGPT and things, but it's a much different experience to go and start dipping your toe in the water and really learning about how this technology can help you with your specific job and what you're trying to do. And so I think there's a lot of training opportunity. And so please keep, keep ideas coming. We're always curious about what else you want to learn. Exactly. And I think it's new still. So we're all still learning, but Brooke and I have done it now. Um, we did it start to finish for the last one. So if you do have any more kind of tactical questions or want to walk through that with us, um, let us know and we'll kind of help you out. Definitely. Okay. You mentioned it can measure audience engagement potentially as a school for speaker training. How does that work? I, I, I probably don't have the steps like one through five for you right now, but essentially at a macro level, what you would do is again, just kind of feed it that data. Um, what, what I have been researching is that there's opportunity for you to actually use the audio, use the video potentially and have it listen for and, and, and spit back out to you like this is where the audience may have been super engaged or this is where, you know, the speaker maybe said, um, 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 <laughs> you know, I mean, there's like all kinds of insights that we can give, but it's really about feeding it that information so it can do that analysis for you. Um, would love to dig into this more. Um, we can maybe start a, a LinkedIn conversation <laughs> or something about it. Yeah. yeah. I know we're very close to the hour. So this is probably our last question, but do running prompts then teach JotGPT your voice pref preferences for use in other sessions? Um, it, I think it depends. So sometimes if you have running prompts and you keep it, I know sometimes it all in the same conversation, it will try to remember, but then it gets like too far back. So what I have done that I find interesting is I save prompts that I like. Um, so I'm like, here's the prompt that I use for this persona, for this audience or to get this reaction. And then I have like a whole file of notes that I'm like, here are my prompts I use for this audience. Here are my prompts I use when I want to see it and want to make it seem a little bit more conversational. Here are the prompts that I use when I'm writing content for myself personally, right? Because it matches my tone and style. So it doesn't save them per se. It will keep track, but it it gets too convoluted when there are too many. So I would say my recommendation um, is to save them personally. Ones that you know are like really hitting the, the nail. Yeah. All right. I think we're, we're going to do a couple more questions. I think we're going to stick around for a few extra minutes if you guys want to stick around as well. Um, and we're going to answer a few more questions. So what's the next one? Does AI provide the options to see the sources of the data or research resources used to generate the content? Not always, no. Um, and I think that that's the hardest part. That's why as individuals, we have to do our due diligence, kind of checking those. Um, and that's just to exercise in figuring out how to kind of what, what to do and how to activate the content that it gives you. Yeah. What's, that? What's next? What, tool are what tools are you using for the Zoom notes? Oh, gosh, I wish I knew this off the top of my head. Major Chorus? fail. I'm so sorry. Chorus, <laughs> so, maybe? Core, that is a tool that uh, one our departments use. I don't think it's the marketing, but oh, yeah. um, I do hear of, you know, course and, and, and you know, 
obviously we're we're just being transparent about what we're using. Um, <laughs> we're not not married to course or anything, but it is really cool, right? Because it actually will like listens. And so it'll tell us if like a certain word keeps coming up um, and things like that. It, it is really, really cool. Um, somebody said in the chat, CC transcripts um, is what they've used. So if any of you that um, were able to stay on the call have some other suggestions, go ahead and throw those in the chat. I think that would be really great. Um, there are a lot of chat GPT and chat bot apps. If you search chat GPT in the Apple store, is there a recommended app for desktops? Have you been using any good tool, desktop tools? I've, I've been just, really going straight to chat GPT in my browser and doing it. Yeah, there me, too. As well. me too. Yeah. I haven't found the need to like, it. like there's no separate app for the desktop that I found yet, but I've been using, um, all of the ones that I've tried out have all been web-based like right yeah. in the browser. Yeah. We're seeing more and more and more and more and more, right? Um, I'm sure that there is a, a lot a lot of options out there. Um, if you guys find, especially like an app, that would be good. Let me know because I love downloading just another app on my phone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I know we're just a little bit over time. Thank you guys so much um, for your questions. Again, Brooke and I are always up to chat. So if you have questions, other thoughts, you want to talk about stuff, share something that really worked well um, for you and your AI journey, uh, let us know. Otherwise, we're going to kind of wrap up. Um, and I just want to remind everybody uh, to take the survey over on the side, um, right over there underneath kind of the Q&A tab. We would love to hear your feedback on how you uh, thought the session went today. Um, and we have some really, really great webinars coming up. So hopefully we will see you on um, some of these. We've got a really great stuff about um, sales and marketing integrations um, shortly. And I know there are some other good ones um, that we are in the works of launching right now, Brooke and I. So uh, hopefully we will see you again um, at one of our other webinars.